Welcome back, I'm That Chemist, and today we have a story where somebody got absolutely baptized by a battery. My incident happened in high school. I forget what exactly we were doing, but it involved melting and then slowly oxidizing about 25 grams of magnesium. To make a very long story short, one of the class clowns in my chemistry class somehow managed to drop a crucible full of molten magnesium. This went about exactly as you would expect, and I heard the ceramic shatter, had just enough time to look over wondering what the heck was going on, and then got completely arc blinded by 25 grams of magnesium going poof all at once. Yikes. One of the other somewhat frightening stories I have involves doing an azeotropic distillation of chloroform and acetone. Despite having an active stir bar and several boiling chips in the bottom of my flask, it managed to bump so hard that it blew my distillation apparatus apart and shot boiling chloroform and acetone all over the place. Here's the kicker. At that moment, I was lifting the fume hood sash and reaching in in order to lower the heating mantle mainly because I was afraid of it bumping, and I knew it should have been boiling at that point. I didn't end up getting injured, but I was splashed with an embarrassing amount of boiling chloroform and acetone, and ended up having to retire that lab coat because it was very stained with my, thankfully, non-toxic product. This is a friendly reminder for everyone here, if you're ever boiling a solvent, make sure you use a boiling stone. If you're doing stuff under reflux, if you don't have a stir bar, you should use a boiling stone. And if you're doing a distillation, usually a stir bar isn't a good enough nucleation site for those bubbles to form on. And if you use boiling stones, it'll be far more effective than if you don't. In high school, a chem teacher just gave me an old bottle of mercury-2 nitrate. And of course, I made mercury thiocyanate out of it to do the Pharaoh's serpent experiment. Lighting it up grows a long curvy stick-like snake. So anyway, I had about 10 half-inch balls of the stuff, which we lit on the balcony in the dorm. And I didn't use any gloves once they were dry. Yikes. Handling mercury salts without gloves is not great. I also poured some Mercury-1 solution on my hands while filming a high school project about mercury precipitates, and Mercury-1 chloride can be seen dripping on the side of the test tube. I'm assuming that they mean they got this on their hand. Aside from that, I think I only dropped some nickel and some bismuth solution on my skin in high school, but so far so good. I really hope you don't get any toxic effects from these, but yeah, you should definitely be more careful. My dad is very keen on hygiene and order around the house. Sometimes he goes on a cleaning marathon and obviously doesn't skip the water closet, which is a very small room with no ventilation. His cleaning process involves using a large amount of drain cleaner in the toilets, closing the door to keep it all in there and completely forget about the toilets. More than once, I've had an urge to go take a pee, open the door, enter the room, lock the door, and almost faint at the first breath. Now that I am more aware of the risk, it happens that I have to relieve myself peeking my head outside of the room to breathe. Seriously, if you use household chemicals, make sure the room is well ventilated. I don't know what toilet cleaner your dad is using that makes it unbearable to breathe in there, but that doesn't sound like a good cleaner to just leave sitting in an unventilated room. That is terrifying. This story comes from a comment section on a Nile Red video. Part of the final exam for an organic chemistry lab course was to follow a synthetic procedure to get a product. They did it in pairs, so a couple of students got to prepare acetyl salicylic acid, aspirin. At the end, they were supposed to get crystals, but instead they were left with some weird yellow oil with no chance to crystallize. They were sure that they had failed the test, until one of them remembered that he had a pack of aspirin pills in his bag. Bingo! They quickly crushed them, extracted them with chloroform, and recrystallized them to get nice crystals. So the professor came and examined the product. He asked them many questions about the procedure, reaction conditions, etc. At the end, he scratched his head and said, You know, every year we get this weird yellow oil, but you guys were the first one to get crystals. This is sneaky, and if you try and cheat the system, sometimes you will get caught. The real test was whether or not they cheated. Our lab uses what is called a cryocool for some of our longer-running reactions that require minus 78 degrees Celsius. This apparatus has a metal tube with cold liquid running through it to keep the solvent at minus 78 degrees Celsius. A few years ago, our senior lab member, at the time, was quenching a reaction that had been running in the cryocool. She turned off the stirring and moved on to work up her reaction. It wasn't until several minutes later and a horrible smell wafting through the entire place that we all knew something was wrong. After some sniffing out the problem, we walked in our half lab where the cryocool is, and smoke and vapor were coming from the doer on the stir plate. It turns out the stirring she turned on was not the stirring, but the heat. And she didn't turn it off. Oh no, she turned it to as high as it would go. She melted the bottom of the doer to the stir plate. To this day, we keep this stir plate around to remind ourselves two things. One, no one is immune to mistakes. And two, even though you've done something hundreds of times, you still need to pay attention. And we actually have pictures of this. So this is the first picture where the cryocool is in a doer. You can see there's like a spatula and a lot of weird tape marks there. I have no idea what those tape marks are. If you have any idea what those weird tape marks are, let me know in the comments. And here we have the picture after, where you can see the plastic from the doers just absolutely caked onto the stir plate. Yikes. 
Not my story, but my father's. When my father worked in the laboratory during his master's thesis, he also had to work in the laboratory of the Chemistry Institute. In this laboratory, work was often done with mercury, and this was not really considered the best circumstances from today's point of view. Mercury was often spilled, but of course it was cleaned up immediately. Several years later, about five to seven years after the completion of his work, they found out that a huge amount of spilled mercury had accumulated under the tiles. This mercury was under the tiles for about two decades, and everyone who had worked in that lab inhaled those fumes. The 90s were still apparently a different time in Austria. That's why in the chemistry laboratories, there is usually an annual control of the fluxes, at least in this lab. It's pretty scary to imagine that that much mercury could have accumulated under the tiles. My gut feeling here is that if there was that much mercury, it wasn't off-gassing that quickly. If there was enough mercury to coat the whole bottom of the tiles, there probably wasn't too much being evaporated into the lab. At least that's what I would hope. It's pretty scary to hear that a ton of mercury accumulated under the tiles, though, and I don't know how that happened, but it definitely shouldn't have happened. Yikes. Today's Yikes awardee is Ralix Lewis. On Monday, we got a shipment of anhydrous sodium bisulfate at work. I was the only one who greeted the delivery drivers. They started handling the bags of 25 kilogram powdered acid like they were sandbags and had zero PPE. I immediately asked them where their PPE was, at least gloves and eye protection. Their response was something like, oh, we're used to it, so it's fine. Powdered acid is only dangerous if it's mixed with water. I was baffled. Also, did I forget to mention that it was raining outside? So the bags did get wet and they had been mishandled, so several bags had small cuts in them. After they left, I wrote an email to the distributor's salesperson, as the delivery had been done internally on their end. I cc'd their higher-ups and mine, and the president of that company responded that sodium bisulfate wasn't that dangerous, but that some precautions still needed to be taken, to which I responded that absolutely no precautions had been taken, and that even if sodium bisulfate wasn't classified as being a dangerous material, there were still some risks, eyes slash skin slash lungs. I've had some on my skin before, and every time since then I'm itchy just looking at the bags. I also mentioned that I wasn't trying to put anyone in trouble, but since most people aren't chemically literate and have a poor understanding of the risks associated with handling them, it was important to have proper PPE, even for transporters. My boss called me later during the day and said, wow, you lit those guys up. But it's fine, because you're absolutely in the right. People need to be shown how to properly do things. People will sometimes do things that are dangerous, and sometimes were those people. So it's important to not have apathy and correct those who are doing things wrong, and it's also important to be open to correction, because we are often the ones who are wrong. Way back in ninth grade physical chemistry, I don't know what chemistry you were doing where you had a specific physical chemistry unit, because to my memory, we did it. We were doing a lab on boiling point elevation and depression. One of the experiments involved boiling water in an Erlenmeyer flask, plugging the neck with a rubber stopper, and then cooling the flask, creating a vacuum, and observing the water boiling at lower temperatures. I must have pressed a bit harder on my stopper than most students, because my stopper ended up getting sucked completely into the neck of the flask. My teacher would correct me. Science doesn't suck, it blows. This was a Friday lab. My instructor was amused by the stuck stopper, but not nearly as amused as we all were when we came into class the following Monday. Waiting for us on a cart in the front of the classroom was a microwave with its walls ballooned outward the door hanging loosely from one hinge, and several pieces of broken glass vaguely recognizable as the remains of an Erlenmeyer flask. Rather than drill out the stopper, my instructor decided it would be fun to spend Friday evening boiling the water in the microwave to force the stopper out. Instead, it created a steam explosion and an unforgettable mental image of the exploded microwave. I think that microwave was doomed from the start of that experiment, and I suspect that my instructor knew that. The stopper shooting out like a cannonball would have likely done similar damage. Yeah, this wasn't a great idea. We do have a recreation of this from Dolly that DevOps submitted. So this is what machine learning thinks this looked like. Definitely entertaining, a little bit interesting. If you haven't checked out Dolly Mini before, you should go check it out. It's time to share the most terrifying story of my grandfather. He was working as a senior production supervisor in a no longer classified, however still pretty restricted research institute of rocket propellants in central Russia, shortly after the collapse of the USSR. This institute has been researching and producing fuel for ballistic missiles in Soviet times. I clearly remember how he once suddenly got a phone call from his work at 2 a.m. on a Saturday, and was urged to come down there immediately. Needless to say, that was very strange and unusual. The only thing that he told me back then is that there was corrosion in one of the barrels for rocket propellants. I was a kid and never asked about the details, because I wouldn't have understood anything anyway. After many years, I asked him about the incident. He told me that a 20 cubic meter tank containing UDMH got corroded from the inside, which, in combination with the structural fatigue and high pressure, resulted in a gaping hole forming in the bottom of the tank, which led to a devastating leakage of all 20 cubic meters of UDMH. Fortunately, that happened at night, so no one was in the containment area. The consequences of this were being dealt with for several weeks. So if you're not sure what UDMH is, it's unsymmetrical dimethyl hydrazine, which is a highly explosive and highly, highly toxic chemical. This is terrifying. This is such a scary story. That is a lot of unsymmetrical dimethylhydrazine. Yikes. This is today's big story. 
One day I was walking in front of a parked van as the battery randomly exploded. Never seen a lead acid battery explode like that before or since, but it blew a hole right through the plastic grill and stuck acid covered plastic shards in shrapnel all down one side of me. I was only wearing swim trunks as I was at work, at the beach renting jet skis, so there was pretty much zero protection. No safety shower either, so I used a safety running leap off the dock over a row of jet skis into the water. It was a freak accident. The van wasn't being used and had been parked for a week or more. I walked by it every day once or twice where it was parked, and one day, just as I was exactly in front of it, kablooey. I suspect the vents got clogged and it overheated, then overpressurized in the hot sun and burst. And that's how I ended up being basically naked and soaked in battery acid with plastic shrapnel sticking out of me. Sometimes, no matter how safe you are, random unexpected stuff can still happen out of nowhere for no reason other than coincidence. I wasn't in a lab working with batteries. I was along a public sidewalk next to a parking lot on my way back from taking a leak. It was as unforeseeable as it gets, walking by a line of hundreds of parked cars, an everyday thing anyone in a city or parking lot does. And one gets me, it's like an IED. Or, I can learn my lesson and wear a lab coat and goggles to the beach, lol. I don't have too much commentary on this other than that's terrifying. Whenever I'm driving and I see a car on fire on the side of the road, which isn't a frequent occurrence, but it happens from time to time, I just remember how much gasoline is in a car and how dangerous that is. This is absolutely a terrifying story, and maybe I'm going to have to look twice before I walk in front of a car. Not entirely a chemistry story, but there are some wacky levels of exposure in it. I used to work in a steel mill that takes in carcinogenic contaminated steel crap. They process it by essentially burning it off and sucking off the noxious gases and dealing with it in a separate part of the plant. It was a closed building, as you can imagine, that could refresh its volume every 10 minutes by having negative pressure inside of the building. Due to the nature of the materials involved, we wore overalls, and one time we used overalls alongside a full-face respirator with forced airflow, which had two very specific filters. One day, we were pouring some steel into a ladle. Think a big bucket. Due to the heat density and height from which the molten steel was poured, the insulation at the bottom had weakened to the point where the metal could melt straight through it and cause nearly 50 tons of molten steel to spill on the floor. This caused one of the biggest fires I've ever seen. But as soon as it appeared, it also disappeared due to the intense smoke buildup. When I stretched my hand out, I couldn't even see my hand anymore. All I could feel was the temperature of the room rapidly increasing. It was already 50 plus degrees in there. And my carbon monoxide detector was already out of range, which had a range of 0 to 2000, I believe. And I started smelling things through my filters, which was wild enough on its own. Scents like molten lead, steel, and nickel. I saw one of my colleagues, who had tripped over his own feet from the sudden jolt of the flames, hoisted him onto his feet, and proceeded to slowly crawl our way to the exit, purely based on memory. Everyone made it out. No one got hurt. Naturally, we had our blood tested for carbon monoxide levels. Gotta be the scariest three minutes I've ever experienced. That is a terrifying story. I know I've said this before, but I'm going to say it again. Molten metals are terrifying. Molten metals can do a lot of damage in a really short amount of time, so I'm glad to hear that none of you guys got seriously hurt. So I am currently doing a chemistry undergrad. That sounds like a euphemism. Last semester, we had a lab where we were supposed to measure the conductivity of a saponification reaction of sodium hydroxide and ethyl acetate. So off we went and started the reaction and put our conductivity probes in the reaction. Very quickly, our solution started turning black. That is not meant to happen. We pull out the probes and they're all melting and disintegrating. The lab supervisors were very unhelpful and the lab tech was so confused. I looked it up and the body of the probes were made of ABS plastic, which doesn't play well with ethyl acetate. So that day we ruined about $1,200 worth of conductivity probes and had no viable results, yet they still wanted us to write a report on it. From the calculations I could do with what little results I had, my percentage difference ended up being 5,275%. So yeah, if you're designing a lab for undergrads, always make sure that the equipment you provide is compatible with the reagents involved. Edit. Oh, and there is no organic waste container in the lab. Most people just poured their concoction down the sink. I can't imagine that's good for the pipes. In this case, it's probably not great. I think the worst thing here is that dissolved ABS crap that's going down the sink. That's probably not great. But the base and ethyl acetate probably isn't too concerning because that's essentially just drain cleaner, ethanol, and acetate. But yeah, the dissolved plastic, that's not great. Well, I haven't got a super exciting story, but I do have a funny story. For the last lesson after our GCSEs, we were told that we could make rockets out of a plastic bottle, methane, and pure oxygen from a cylinder. The pairs of students in the class did this one by one until one pair's bottle was sent into the ceiling, after rebounding from a desk, causing the ceiling tile to fly upwards into the cavity between the ground and the second floor. In this case, nothing was really damaged, but I'd have thought that our chemistry teacher would have got smart to the dangers of this at this point. Unfortunately, he hadn't, so he kept going. We finally got to my bottle last. I had high hopes for it because I'd properly done the moles calculation and even tried to cool the bottle before putting in the gases to increase the pressure a little. Yes, I'm a chemistry nerd at school. As our bottle was lit, it did indeed fly very well, but a little too well. It ran straight into the window and broke it. <laughs> oh no! 
Fortunately, there was no one outside, but that could have been bad. Also, I felt very bad, but it wasn't exactly my fault that I filled it too well. Or was it, lol. Moral of the story, when something goes wrong, don't just keep trying it. Moral number two, don't fire rockets indoors. And we actually have a picture of what one of these rockets looks like right here. Very cool. Okay, I'll bite. Here's my favorite science joke for the end screen. Heisenberg, Schrodinger, and Ohm are carpooling to a conference when they get pulled over by a cop. He comes up to the window and asks, Sir, do you have any idea how fast you are going? Heisenberg says, No, but I know exactly where I am. The cop says, You are going 85 and a 70. To which Heisenberg shouts, Great, now we're lost. The cop thinks that this is suspicious and decides to search the vehicle. He comes back and says, Are you aware that there's a dead cat in the trunk of this car? Schrodinger says, Well, we do now, butthole. The cop arrests all of them for animal cruelty, but also gets Ohm for resisting. This is hilarious. Have a great day.